If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11 this morning, we'll be focusing in just a moment on verses 19 through 30 of Acts chapter 11. Titled the message this morning, Naming Rights. There's an outline in your bulletin if you'd like to use that to follow along with us this morning just to see where it is we're going as we navigate our way through the text. The idea of naming rights is actually going to be building off of the thing that happens here in the book of Acts in verse 26. The disciples are first called Christians here in this passage for the very first time. And so this is something uh, that we're getting that uh, thought of, the idea of naming rights. In the corporate world, in the sports world, corporate naming is a well-established practice. The uh, Vikings are playing now at U.S. Bank Stadium. The, the Twins play at Target Field. The, the um, Timberwolves play at the Target Center. There's those kind of attachments. Now we're seeing different logos and corporate identities being put on baseball and football and all kinds of different uniforms. They have their corporate sponsors uh, in that way. A company will pay big bucks to have that done because they see the value of keeping their brand in front of people. That's not exactly though what's happened with Christianity. It is something that we see happening more organically. I mean, you might have a company that pays to have its name out there, but sometimes it's just adapted. You know, what did you blow your nose on when you had a cold this morning uh, and, and you're looking to do that? You, you might say if it's technically a, a tissue, but most of us take the time to refer to a Kleenex. Whether it's actually a Kleenex brand or not, it's something that's just been incorporated into our language. It's perceived as being synonymous with the product that it's actually a part of. How do you look for something when you're grabbing your smartphone and you're, you're going to make a search? Uh, we, I suppose we could say we're going to do a web search, but most of it, we're just going to Google it, right? Because it's just part of what we do. It's how we look at something. It's just become connected with that. I would suggest to you this morning, that's really what's happening in this passage, that Jesus isn't so much a corporate brand looking for an identity, even though he did obviously very much pay for the connection that we share with him. It is rather we are connected with Jesus. We are part of his identity. He is part of our identity because of how closely these Christians here in Acts chapter 11 mirror the behavior of Jesus himself. It's an organic connection. So let's look and see how we establish that as we look to the passage this morning. Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 19. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Luke writes, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who were on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, or the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord." The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarshish to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined every one, according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. This is the word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live 
and then on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing here to the reading of his word this morning. As you might have saw from that title slide, the main point that we want to leave you with this morning that you should walk away from this text is talking about how Jesus is working through his people. Jesus is working through his people, and we see that through his people, he is building his church. He is building his church. And you make that connection as we are working our way through this, that he is going to do so, first of all, situationally. How is he accomplishing that? We read in verse 19 that the people are scattered. Now, let's think through. We, we, if you are just here with us for this week, you are coming in the middle of an ongoing series we started in Acts chapter 1 uh, several months ago, and we have made our way progressively up here to chapter 11. They are referring, Luke is making reference to, as we've just now finished up the scenario, Peter dealing with Cornelius, bringing the gospel to the Gentiles formally. By the way, this is a fulfillment of something that Jesus told Peter he would do. You remember the passage in Matthew, uh, some of you, where Jesus says to Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's that familiar to many of you there? There's actually a discussion which we won't settle this morning on who is the rock is the rock Jesus, is the rock Peter, is the rock Peter's confession. Some people would recoil and say, well, the Peter isn't the rock because that's what Roman Catholics believe. I actually think there's a good, good conclusion to be made, good consideration to say that it is Peter. And whether or not we're going to settle that this morning, what I do think is happening, if you continue to read on that passage, what does Jesus tell Peter? I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom, which, by the way, that's where we get all those jokes about meeting St. Peter at the pearly gates, because people are talking about that. But what is he doing? Is he really standing at the pearly gates, letting people in and out? I don't really think that's what he's talking about. What I think he is talking about is what happens in Acts chapter 2 and what happens in Acts chapter 10. What's he doing? He is making sure the gospel goes to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, and he is making sure that the gospel goes to the Gentiles. The Apostle Paul would be the apostle to the Gentiles, but Peter would be the one to open the doors. Peter would be the one to make sure that the gospel message was heard and proclaimed initially. And I think that's what he's talking about there. But why are they scattered? Going back here to Acts 11 and verse 19. They are scattered because of the persecution. This is the stoning of Stephen. There's great persecution that's happened, and who is responsible for helping to lead that persecution? It's somebody who's mentioned here later in the text. It's Saul that's mentioned in verse 25. Of course, we've already now learned in the meantime that God has worked in Saul's life, and the one who is responsible for persecuting the church of God has been transformed by that very same gospel message. So Barnabas seeks him out. But in the process of this dispersion, what are they doing? You're looking in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. If you want to see, there arose that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And then you skip down to verse 4, and it says, as they were scattered, they went about preaching the word. Why are they scattered? Why did they leave? It, we just saw in that passage in, in Acts chapter 8, they're doing so because of persecution. They're going, doing so because of hardship. Where do they end up? This is where Luke picks up the narrative back here in Acts eleven nineteen. They travel to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. These are all places that if you look on the map in the back of your Bible or you look later on on a map program uh, online, these are all places that exist today. Phoenicia, if you want to make a, a connection to what we see in modern geography, this is Lebanon, uh, the country that's just north of Israel uh, in that country, in that area of the world today. It's a seacoast area. Tyre and Sidon are ones that factor pretty prominently in Bible geography. Probably one of the ways that you would be very familiar with that if you're an Old Testament scholar of any familiarity at all is when David is building the temple, he's collecting um, materials for his son Solomon to build the temple. 
he has gifted from the king of Lebanon uh, cedars to be used in the construction of the temple. Later on, Hiram, the, the king of Tyre and Sidon, gives some cedars to Solomon to continue on in the, the construction uh, of the, the temple and, and related structures that he's building there. Uh, and so that's one of the ways that you see Israel having a good relationship with its neighbors and the cedars of Lebanon uh, incorporating in. Tyre and Sidon is also something that Jesus mentions when he's rebuking people uh, during his ministry. It's going to be better for you, uh, or better for Tyre and Sidon in that day than for you, because you've had access to the Old Testament law. You've had access to the Old Testament scriptures. That's something that, again, would have been a relatively close place. It would be like for us in Minnesota that we were dispersing to Wisconsin or, or, or someplace like that. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a neighboring territory, a neighboring region. Cyprus was the island where Barnabas is actually mentioned to be from when we were introduced to him earlier in the narrative. It's a, a island right there in the Mediterranean, just off the coast of Israel and Lebanon and Syria and Turkey uh, in that area. And there was a great group of Jewish people that met there, that had formed a community that was also kind of the Rochester, Minnesota of its day because there was a lot of medical research and, and things that were going on uh, in Cyprus during that community. Antioch uh, is a city that still exists in some fashion uh, today uh, there in Syria. Uh, and as that uh, was a, a center for commercialism. There was a port city that was there, so a lot of trade and all the things that come with people doing business there. It, was not, it did not necessarily have a reputation as a moral center, even though there was a lot of religions that kind of uh, conglomerated there around that area because of all the different people groups that would come to do their business and trade. It also allowed for some degree of anonymity uh, which led to the practice of all kinds of sinful wickedness and, and vices uh, there as well. It was a place that needed the gospel. And what you see that they are speaking to here, uh, as the text tells us, that there were some, in the end of verse 19, speaking to a Jewish audience. And so they're going to a place like Cyprus, where there's already an established Jewish community, and they're talking about the gospel. They're impressing upon their neighbors and friends that Jesus is the Messiah. But we also see them speaking to what the ESV here says is Hellenist in verse 20. They are preaching the Lord Jesus. This means they are speaking to a new audience without necessarily understanding what Peter has done here in Acts chapter 10. As they're being dispersed, they're starting to engage other people in the situation that they've encountered. And as they go, finding a new home, finding a new place to do business, etc., etc., in the chaos and distress of their life, they're still allowing the light of Christ to shine through. Friends, what this reminds us of is that when God allows difficulty and challenges and trial in our life, don't forget that while God might have a plan for you and you might be looking at that situation and say, has God abandoned me? Why did I lose my job? Why have I gotten this major health crisis? Why is this loved one's death weighing so heavily on our situation right now? Why don't my kids listen? Why are they going astray after all the ways they've been raised, right? And they're exploring and, and doing these things. It's distressing to me, Lord. Why are you letting these things happen to me? What we should remember is what Joseph tells his brothers in Genesis, where he says, what you intended for evil, God meant for good. What we remember is what Paul says in Romans 8, 28, that when things are wavering, when things are uncertain, we know that all things work together for good to those that love the Lord, to those who are the called according to His purpose. The circumstances might change, and we may not be able to understand exactly what God is doing. If you're a member of the early church here, you're probably wondering, why is God displacing us from our homes. We've got a good thing going. The church is growing. We've got great preaching. People are coming to Christ. 
Why would God allow this persecution and unrest? Why would God make this situation so that we have to go and flee for our physical safety? Why are some of our friends and relatives being taken into custody and imprisoned for just believing in Jesus? Why would God let this happen? God didn't say, you just need to go and plant a church up here or there. That's not the way he worked. He orchestrated the circumstances, and now, looking back, Luke can say, they are scattering because of the persecution, but here is the effect of it. Here's what the gospel is doing. Here is the influence it's having. Friend, don't forget that in your distress and in your difficulty, that God might not have let you know what the plan is, but he has a plan for you, and that plan also fits in the larger picture of the things that he's in control of. He has promised, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. But he's also the one who says in Colossians 1.17, Paul says this about him, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He has not lost control of your situation, and he has not lost control of the purpose that he is working in your life and through your life. Hear the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 6. Beginning in verse 25, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What is Jesus reminding us of there? We might get ourselves worked up. We might feel the anxiety and distress, but don't indulge it. Seek first his kingdom. Stay on point. Remember, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Your situation might be more difficult than you could have imagined just a few short weeks or months ago. But God has not abandoned you. And God is accomplishing in your life, friend, an exceeding eternal weight of glory. The people in the early church may not have seen that, but we see now in Luke's narrative how he was accomplishing that, anticipating that the move, anticipating that the distress would relocate them and accomplish what he said would happen. Jesus said would happen in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. You will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is how God accomplished it. God remained in control. And he remains in control of your life, friend. Though you may not see, though you may not understand, trust in him and he will bring it to pass. In your situation, though you may not understand it, but we also see that the early church is working strategically once they understand what God is doing. Well, first of all, how are they presenting Jesus as they're going around? They know that as they're speaking to the Jews... They have to talk about how Jesus is the Messiah. When we see Jesus Christ, that's something that's significant because when they're talking about Jesus, they're saying to the audience that is out there, 
to the Jewish audience, Jesus is the fulfillment of the promises God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus is the one that when God taught to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he said to Eve, the, the serpent will bruise the head, or you, the, the serpent's head will be bruised by the seed of the woman, even as the serpent would, crush, would bruise the heel of the one who is coming. That prediction was made all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. When God said to Abraham, in you and in your descendants shall all the earth be blessed, there is a promise made of Jesus, the Messiah, who is coming. And they are convincing, persuading their audience, Jesus is the fulfillment of those promises. Jesus is the son of David who is going to rule over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Jesus is the fulfillment of those promises. But I look back here in our passage today. That's not what they're doing when they're speaking to the Hellenists, the, the, the Gentile people that they're seeing come to Christ. As you look in verse 20, they speak to the Hellenists also, not just the Jews that we read about in verse 19, but they preach not Jesus Christ. They preach Jesus as Lord. They are presenting Jesus as the one true God that they need to follow. You can compare that to the message that, for example, if you were just going to do a, a quick scan through the book of Acts. So go back to Acts chapter 5 and verse 42. As the church is growing, it says, every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ, the Messiah, is Jesus, just like we talked about. You see it again in Acts chapter 8 and verse 5. Philip is going to Samaria, and what does he do? He proclaims to the Samaritans, who are half Jews, they would have had some familiarity with the Old Testament, that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Messiah. Acts 9.22, as Saul is converted, what does he do in Damascus? He goes to the synagogue to prove that Jesus was the Christ. But this is something different. They are proclaiming Jesus is Lord because this is what Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. You don't have to turn there. Just listen as I read it. He says, They themselves report concerning us the kind of reception that we had among you and how he's talking to Gentiles in Thessalonians. This is a Gentile church. And how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He's not trying to persuade them that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament promises because Gentiles didn't have the Old Testament. He's trying to say Jesus is better than Zeus and Apollo and all these other deities that you hear about now today in Marvel and Disney and all these things that we've cartoonized and made more friendly. But these were deities that people used to worship. These were people, things that people used to pursue and give their hearts to. And Paul and the early church were telling them, don't look to them, look to the God who made the universe. Look to the God who made you and everything in it. Look to Jesus who died to reconcile you to God, to give you forgiveness so that you can have meaning and purpose in this life and hope and a future in the world to come. You can spend eternity with God in heaven. This is what they are proclaiming. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Lord. He is the one who deserves your loyalty, your worship, and he will give you forgiveness and make you reconciled to himself. Remember that they knew this. They weren't just trying to convert them into Judaism. They were trying to convince them and persuade them that Jesus was Lord. Jesus is God. So they had a strategy and how they were engaging other people with the gospel. They also see here a strategy beginning to develop as the church in Antioch is established, as these other congregations begin to grow a visible identity. Jerusalem did not send these people out to plant churches. This was not an organized effort. But as soon as they found out about it, you see that they establish an association. 
it says in verse 22, the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they send Barnabas, one of their key leaders, to Antioch. When he came, that's Barnabas came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. And he goes and finds a partner to help him in teaching, that's Saul. In verse 26, when he found him, he brought him to Antioch, and for a whole year they met with the people in the church and taught a great many people to the point where that whole label, that whole connection with Jesus, people are called Christians in Antioch because of what is happening, how God is using them, because of the strategy of discipleship that they implement. Jesus is building his church. And so what we should take away from that, friends, is we need to be contributing to what Jesus is doing. We need to be builders, just like we see Barnabas doing, just like we see Saul doing, just like we see these people who are leaving the, what is familiar, running literally for their lives, but not forgetting in the process to talk about their Lord. We have to keep that same kind of mindset. If God is building His churches and preparing people for His kingdom, how are we contributing to that? We have to be intentional. We have to be intentional. As we see modeled in front of us, the people who were dispersed don't have a developed strategy for where they were going or what they were going to, who they were going to talk to maybe at first, but when they started getting into conversations, they knew with the Jewish people you have to approach it this way. But they also knew when they were starting to talk to Gentiles who didn't have the background, who didn't have the familiarity, we have to go about this from a different angle. It's the same Jesus, but there are different truths we need to emphasize in order to help them understand why they need the gospel. So there is an intentionality that's going to take familiarity not only with what God's Word says, but a familiarity of who you're talking to, familiarity of how you're going to help them see their need. If we're sending a foreign missionary to a different country, what do they have to do? Well, most of the time they have to go, among other things, into language school. And that's something that you might be able to do maybe these days with an app on your phone or, or, or something like that to get some of the basics down. But generally, at some point, we're going to send them to that country. Why? Not just so they can technically get the language down, but so they can start to know the people, so they can know how they eat differently, talk differently, live differently, have different values, so that they can speak not just from their own experiences, this is what Jesus has done for me, but so that they can help others see this is how Jesus can make a difference in your life. This is what he can do for you. There has to be some intentionality about the proclamation that we do. That matters here in our lives as well and in our context. We may not need to always go out and learn a foreign language, but Christians, we get very comfortable sometimes with the way that we go about doing things. You know, we, we come here with our church friends and we there, there are certain things we say, there are certain things we don't say, there are certain things we do and don't do. We dress a certain way, we talk a certain way, we maybe educate our kids a certain way. And those things are all wise and good and maybe have their place. But we have to remember, the rest of the world doesn't always live and make the same decisions we do. We might look a little bit weird. We might look a little bit odd. We shouldn't be embarrassed about that, but we should also not grow so content and so comfortable with all of our uniqueness that we forget. It takes some investment and intentionality to be able to speak into somebody else's life who doesn't know the Lord, to help them understand why do they need to know? Why should the gospel make a difference to me? That's going to take some investment on your part. It's easy just to do something like to drop a tract or to put a sign out and hope they show up. It's more difficult to establish a relationship, to establish a familiarity, to understand what the difficulties and challenges that person is going through and help them to see how Jesus can give hope in their darkness in their addiction, in their despair, in their anxieties, in their difficulties. 
Friends, Christ has put us to be the light of the world. We can do what this, and there's something good to be done here when you're speaking to people just like you. But where the church really starts to blossom, where even Jerusalem begins to take note, is when these Christians started getting outside of what was familiar and shining the light of Christ in dark places. What we also see is the intentionality of bringing others to do that with us. We see Barnabas sought out Saul. He actually went to Antioch, saw the need, and then went somewhere else to bring Saul in, somebody who we'd invested in, somebody who God had used him in, in, in Saul's life previously and said, join me. Here's what we're going to do. And they saw God work. Saul realized his potential to the point where Eventually, he becomes a central figure for the rest of the book of Acts. Barnabas is prominent. Barnabas is important. But eventually, Barnabas kind of fades into the background. But Saul, or Paul, would not be used of God in anywhere near the same way if it hadn't been for Barnabas and his investment. It is not about the prominence that we gain. It is about what Jesus is able to do through servants who are yielded and willing to be used by him. Friend, whose life are you pouring into that might be that next Saul, might be that next Paul, might be that next Sunday school teacher, might be the one who God is going to use to be a deacon in the church, might be the next musician, might be the next godly father or mother who brings more people into the world to raise in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Friends, each one of us has a place in God's plan and program, but we must be yielded, we must be intentional, we must be looking beyond ourselves to pour into someone else. Who is that person that God might have for you? And then secondly, the last point here, is to be responsive. We see that Jerusalem was doing that when they partnered with the church in Antioch. They didn't plan for this, but when they observed it, they reacted well to it. And they understood that their vision had to be more than just their Jerusalem. They had to keep reaching out as Jesus wanted them to, to the ends of the earth. And they established a partnership. They invested their resources, time, and energies, and people into making sure the gospel kept going, that lives kept being strengthened, churches were established. We have to have that same kind of vision, friends, if we are going to be a a church that fires on all cylinders that God wants us to be. We care for one another, but we can't just care for one another. We also demonstrate compassion to each other. This is part of God's vision for the church, and you see that as this prophecy that takes place here towards the end of the chapter in verses 27 through 30, that it talks about Agabus. We like to kind of focus on, ooh, what's all this whole thing about prophecy? And yes, God did speak, make forth-telling kinds of remarks through his servants, tell them about things that they wouldn't have otherwise known about the future. But even though we're talking about prophecy, let's also understand what was it used for? So, after he prophesied there at the end of verse 28 by the Spirit that there would be a great famine, there would be a time of deprivation, how does the church in Antioch respond? With generosity, verse 29, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. They responded to the truth that God revealed with the way that God wanted them to react. They were instruments of his generosity and care. Even as we were talking in the class I taught earlier in the morning, God doesn't tell us how or what the frequency or regularity should be. You see in verse 29, everyone responds according to his ability. There's not a specific percentage or a set amount, but people are generous as Jesus enables them to be. So friends, let us also think about how we are having a difference 
even as you give to the congregation and the congregation's leadership has been able to exercise, even just this week, more benevolence opportunities. We've had some right here in Rochester. We've had church families we've helped. We've had people in the community we've helped. Not all of it's always been uh, as effective as we would have liked it to be, but we are trying to be the picture of Christ to our community in the responsive opportunities that we have. But we also just gave to a pastor that I met in Liberia last year. We were able to help him with his truck and do a repair. Your leadership took your monies and gave that so he could leave his community and go preach to other churches in Liberia and to continue the work that is going on as little congregations there are seeing the need to keep spreading the gospel in their region with languages that you and I couldn't speak, but they can speak. They're literally crossing borders to keep the work of the gospel going. $600 might not have been a, a big amount to us in the whole scheme of things, but it made a significant difference in Philemon's life. And he sends his greetings and gratitude for what we've been able to do. It's because our church sees that there is a vision, there is a priority beyond our borders, beyond our boundaries. that We must invest, we must connect, we must associate so that the gospel continues to have traction. So it's lubricated. We look to the needs of our own, but not just the needs of our own. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 says that this is a value that followers of Christ should emulate. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And as the gospel goes forth, friends, Jesus works through his people. Jesus works through his local church, places like us. And so we ask at the end, as you consider, how am I being a builder? How am I letting Jesus use me? Let me ask you these three questions. Can others see the beauty of Jesus in you? Even as they're seeing here, as they're leaving, as they're going through this, this distress, people can still hear about Jesus through these people. Do they hear about the authority of Jesus in your conversation and what you talk about? Do they experience the power of Jesus and his compassion? Do they see that demonstrated through your actions and attitudes? Will people look at you and if they say the charge against you is that you're a Christian, will there really be enough evidence to convict you of that?